Well, hi everybody. Today I'm going to be going over Ant's Airplane's Tiger Moth. We'll have a look around the Tiger Moth, run through the features, start it up, take it for a spin around the airport, and then do a short view on it. There is a little bit to go over in this plane, not too much, but there is there's some things to cover. So we'll go ahead and get started here, so hopefully this won't take too long. Okie dokie. Well, here we are in the Tiger Moth, and it looks pretty good in here. I'm not really going to go into the front seat because it pretty much looks like the back seat. We're going to come over here to the back right side of the cockpit, though, but kind of on the right side of your seat. And this is where the tablets are located. There are two of them. One of them is a GPS unit. I'm not really going to go over this one. It's pretty standard. So we're just going to go ahead and put that away. And the other tablet, the main tablet over here. Now, either one of these tablets, you can customize its position around the cockpit. At least most of the time it's around the instrument panel, I guess is the best way to explain it. But pretty much uh, any time the little arrow here, the little cursor changes to this kind of arrow up at the top of the screen, we can go ahead and move it around. And we have cockpit preferences here. This is the first page. Uh, we can show or hide the pilots. You know, we can open the doors, get up a couple other things. One of the neater things I did think that we, we had the option to customize here was the airspeed indicator and the altimeter. So right now this thing is in vintage miles per hour. Go ahead and we can click here and swap it into modern knots. And also come up here and click on the gauge itself, either one of them, and it will swap them out to the three different variants that you have. One of the neater things about this is that the plaque down here actually does change to knots or miles per hour, depending upon which gauge you have. And then we have windshield. It's pretty much just going to give you a clean windshield or a dirty windshield with persistent oil and fuel. This is going to track the oil and fuel level of your plane between flights. So whatever the fuel level, oil level was at when you last left it on your last flight, next time you come in here, it's going to be the same. Front mouse zones. It's pretty much just going to stop you from being able to click on anything in the front cockpit when you're back here. And then we have rolling resistance. I, I guess the easiest way to explain this is that it kind of slows the Tiger Moth down on the ground so it doesn't roll too quickly. And then we have engine realism. There are really only two settings here, easy and hard. We're going to go to the next page, which is exterior preferences. Again, some more customization options. I'm not really going to go through all of them for the most part. You know, it, they're kind of self-explanatory. You can kind of mess around with this one. But we can take the engine covers off. We can swap out the tailwheel for a skid, that kind of thing. The third page is engine start. I'm not going to go over this until we actually do begin starting up the engine here. And the same thing kind of goes over here for the second to last page, which is the autopilot. I'm going to go over this when we get in the air. It's not incredibly complicated, but there are maybe one or two things you might want to know before you start using it. And then we have the radios. And that's pretty much it for the tablet. So to get rid of the tablet, we just need to click on this little red button here, and it'll put it away. Alrighty, well, let's go ahead and get this thing started. So we'll come over here to the engine start page. Now, the quickest and easiest way to start this thing is going to be by clicking here on quick start or clicking up here, kind of on the left side of the instrument panel to go ahead and just start it up. Before you do start it up, I would suggest putting the chocks in. This thing does have a tendency to kind of want to creep forward a little bit when the engine gets going. Now, as far as engine realism for the startup for hard and easy, there are three steps that you won't have to go through if you have this thing on easy. I will let you know when when we get to those steps where you should kind of start up for easy but I'm gonna start this thing up on hard because why not so we have carburetor primer here right now it's in the red and so we're gonna to need to prime this thing this thing has a two-step priming process so we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna press control 4 we're gonna hop out here to the right side of the engine we're gonna open up the engine compartment it's got kind of a nice little animation to it but the primer itself is kind of located here on the left side of the intake for the carburetor I'm going to go ahead and click on it three times. You can probably get away with just clicking on it once. We'll go ahead and do that. Next, step two is going to be that we need to press Control 5. Come out here to the front of the plane. We're going to need to pull the propeller through four times. I'm going to go ahead and pull it through five real quick just to demonstrate something. But in case you do manage to overprime this thing, the easiest way to get rid of that is to just come down here and pull the prop backwards instead of forwards. That should clear it out. So we'll hop back in the cockpit here real quick. And as you can see now, it says primed, and we have our engine prime here up at 94. It's probably going to be closer to 90 if you do it the proper way of just priming it, or just pulling the prop through four times. We're looking for anything between 75 and 100. Now, any one of these steps that I've just done, you can go ahead and just click on them in here in the tablet, and it will go ahead and do it for you. You won't actually have to hop out of the plane. You will still have to click on the propeller to pull it forward three t four times, but you won't have to get out of the plane. So the next step is we're going to need to go ahead and crack the throttle a little bit. 
when we get it kind of into the right position, it should say set here. Now, if you are doing this on easy, this is pretty much where you're going to pick up. We're going to need to hop out here to the sort of left side of the cockpit here. We've got two sets of magnetos here, one up front for the co-pilot, one back here for the pilot. Now, I have set these up to linked because it just makes it a little bit easier. So we can go ahead and just flip on the right magneto. It's really the only, only one you need to have turned on. And it'll go ahead and turn both magnetos on for both the co-pilot and the pilot. If you have this on independent, you're going to need to do both of them independently, obviously. Anyway, now that we've gotten this done, we're going to go ahead and press Control 5 again. We're going to hop at, back out to the front of the plane. We're just going to go ahead and click on Pull Prop Through, and we'll start the plane up. And we're going to hop back in the cockpit, because there's still a couple things left to go over. Now, as you can see, we are decreasing here in our spark plug condition percent. This is because technically we're building carbon up on the spark plugs. There really is one way to avoid this and two ways to fix this if it happens. The way to avoid it is to just make sure that you have your RPM up here at, at 900. And as we put it up here to 900, the condition will start to increase again. The other way is to click on spark plug condition here in the tablet and it will go ahead and return it to 100. The second way to fix this is to just press control 4, come out here to where the engine is and help you not lose an arm thanks to the propeller. And you can click on either one of the spark, any one of the spark plugs in here. I'm still not entirely sure if you have to click on all four of them or you can get away with just clicking on one of them and it doesn't, but either way. There are technically eight spark plugs on this engine, but the only ones you can click on are here on the right side of the engine. The last thing to kind of cover here in the engine compartment is the oil filter. So you can click on this and it'll flip the oil filter over. Now, according to the manual, you need to do this every day. I'm going to assume that means every couple of flights, and I'll be honest with you, I haven't noticed any any problems with the plane if you don't do it. So, not entirely sure whether or not you need to. But either way, that's pretty much it here for the engine compartment, so we'll go ahead and close up the door here. Hop back into the cockpit, because there's one last thing to go over. And that is the oil level. Now, if you are flying this on easy, none of these last two things will affect you in any way. But if you're flying it on easy, you will still burn oil, it just won't damage the motor in any way. But for those of you flying on hard, you know, if it gets below about 40%, somewhere in there it's going to seize the motor up. I don't necessarily think it's that big of a deal. Uh, you tend to only burn about a percent of your oil off about every 10 minutes. So, I mean, it'll take you a while to actually burn all the oil off. But either way, uh, if you have to refill the oil, just come up here to the weight menu. You have the oil tank here little slider here that you can increase the oil percentage or the oil the amount of oil the only thing I will say is that if you manage to if you are refilling the fuel what's going to happen is it's going to move the oil tank percentage down to 50 so you will need to put that back up to 100 but other than that it works out fine and then the last thing is going to be that at least according to the manual and this little plaque I think up here at the top of the instrument panel you need to sit here for about four minutes and let this thing warm up I have not noticed a problem with how it performs or anything like that for not warming it up. So it probably is how it is in real life, but it doesn't seem to really make a difference in here. I could be wrong, but I haven't noticed anything. So that's pretty much it. We're going to head out here to the grass and take the thing off, and then I'm going to show you how kind of a little bit about the autopilot. We're going to go over this ridiculous compass here. Alrighty. I want to go over two things here real quick that I forgot to mention earlier. One, you want to turn on the left magneto after you get it started so you don't do what I did and get out here realize you forgot. The other thing is that you can actually turn the left and the right magnetos on in here in the cockpit from kind of the left and the right corners of this plaque right here. That way you won't have to lean outside the cockpit. And with that kind of out of the way, I'm going to go ahead and kind of run through everything here. Now as far as how this thing taxis, it's a really well behaved plane to taxi. It might take you a little bit to get it rolling, especially if you're in the sort of like the rolling resistance, I think it's like high mode or whatever it is, but it's probably going to take you about 1200 RPM to kind of get it to initially roll. Now this thing does have brakes, which the original Tiger Moth did not have, or the real one does not have. That's fine with me, I don't really care. I am going to attempt to land this thing without brakes though, so we'll see how that goes. The only thing to kind of be careful of is it does have a tendency to kind of want to tip itself over if you try and turn it while you're going too fast, so it, it can tip itself over. But other than that, it's, again, really well behaved here on the ground. So we're going to go ahead and, and just begin throttling it up here. Bring it up to about 2100 RPM. Probably won't need too many 
like maybe some minor rudder inputs here to kind of help keep it straight. But either way, it's a pretty well-behaved plane. And around about 30 to 35 miles an hour, the tail is probably going to lift off the ground for you. And once we get above 40, we'll want to pull back on the stick a little bit. And it, not, not too much, and it should just lift itself off like right after 40, 45 miles an hour, just before 50. We didn't even get up to 2100. But you should pretty easily be off the ground before 60 miles an hour. Again, it's a really well-behaved little plane. Now, as far as how it flies, I, I actually quite like it. It is a lot of fun to kind of just go mess around in. It's rather responsive, at least to pitch and yaw inputs, but it, it, don't expect much out of it in terms of rolls. It does not roll very well. It has a, actually a really terrible roll rate, which is fine. The original Tiger Moth um, had a pretty bad roll rate, my understanding of it. And so this one does a pretty good job, I think, of simulating that. And that being said, it's still very good at doing you know, aerobatic stunts, stuff like that. Just anything that involves a roll, it's not going to do very well. So, But it does really nice stall turns, it does really nice loops, all of those things. Now, as far as how it does stall in terms of its stall behavior, it's, it's pretty good. It's got a really low stall speed. Something, uh, even though the plaque down there says something like 45 miles an hour, it's probably going to be a little bit lower than that. In terms of top speed, you're looking at something uh, maybe maybe up to 95 miles an hour. It tends to, you know, at 2,000 RPM here, it tends to sit at about 90. You can probably, you know, get it up to about 160 miles an hour. I don't think it will break it at 160 but I have not, I'm not entirely sure about that. What I will say is that you're probably not going to hit 160. I mean, at least for me, most of the fun I have in this plane happens between like zero and a thousand feet anyway. So you, you will probably need to get yourself into a pretty steep dive for a good amount of time to actually hit 160. But either way, it's uh, quite a fun little plane here to fly. So we're going to go through the autopilot here real quick. I'll just bring up the tablet. Come back over here to the autopilot. We'll go ahead and turn the autopilot on. When we turn the autopilot on, we're going to get the wing leveler. It's going to come on by default. So we're just going to go ahead and hit heading hold. We'll hit altitude hold. Now, the reason I actually wanted to bring up the autopilot is because of the increments of change that are, that are, that are here for this thing. So when we, we click on the, any one of the arrows for the heading, at least, it's going to increase it by 10 degrees. And if you want to increase it by a single degree, you're going to need to click to decrease it here on the right side of the left arrow. I hope that made sense. And then if you want to increase it by a single degree, you want to click on the whatever the last number is and it will increase it. Or really anywhere over here, kind of. Anyway. Same thing goes for the altitude. This, But this one's going to go up by increments to 1,000. And then the, the minimum increment that you can increase or decrease it by is going to be in the hundreds. And so it functions pretty much the same way, you know, the inside of this is going to change to the hundreds and increase it here. And that's pretty much it for the autopilot, so we'll go through the compass here. Alright, now we've got the compass. It's a little, it's a little, honestly it's a little ridiculous. Either way, what we have here is we have this cross right here. It's actually sort of moving. This is the pointer. And it's always, the cross is always going to be north, and it's always going to be pointing north. And so what we have here is the outer dial of it that has all the degrees on it. We're going to want to rotate this around to start off with to make sure that the compass is heading towards north. So right now, the horizontal line in the cross is pretty much parallel to this horizontal line, and the vertical line is pretty close to being parallel here. Now we have this white line up here that's kind of outlined in black that's now pointing towards east. This is your current heading. So right now we're heading roughly 90 degrees. Maybe a little off on that, but for the purposes of the demonstration, it doesn't really matter. So what, let's say what we want to do is we want to change our heading so that we can head, like, let's say to, we'll, we'll go to 50 degrees here. So we want to head to 50 degrees. So we'll just move the dial around here until our current heading line here lines up with 50 degrees. We're not going 50 degrees now because this is still pointing in this direction. So we need to turn the plane I'm just going to do this on the autopilot here because it's easier. 
And as we start to bank the plane, you can see that the pointer here is starting to rotate itself, and when it lines up again so that it's parallel with north, and it's pointing to north, that pretty much means that we are on course now. So when this kind of stops moving around and everything becomes parallel again, we're now heading at 50 degrees. So that is pretty much how you use this thing to actually navigate. So hopefully that was an okay explanation of it. But either way, it, it, it's, it's pretty easy kind of once you understand what you're doing here. Either way, the last thing I guess to talk about here is the lock on the, the thing. Now, this is really has no purpose in the simulator. Uh, the only thing that I will say is if it is locked, you can't move the dial. But other than that, it doesn't really serve a purpose because uh, normally you would lock it in the real one because as the plane kind of vibrates, moves around, it would kind of jostle the, the, the dial here for your, your heading like out of position. And so you would lock it down so that it would hold still and it wouldn't move while you were flying. But again, in here in the sim, it doesn't really make a difference. So we're going to go ahead and, I guess, head back to the runway, which is probably going to take me like 15 minutes. So I guess I'll see you all back here when I get to the, uh, of the runway. Alrighty. Well, I finally got here. We're going to begin back in the throttle off quite a bit, actually, in this one. It, it does not slow down too fast. Uh, really, it, it doesn't bleed off that much speed, even at a fairly low RPM. It's not a complaint or anything like that, but it just stays in the air all the time, which is a good thing. So anyway, we'll be coming in here again pretty slow. I wanna, you, can, you, you can sit down at around about 60 miles an hour and it, it's probably fine. Uh, 50 is probably, a, 50 or 55 is probably better speed for it. But either way, So we'll just go ahead and reach the throttle a little bit more. See if we can set down here at about 55. Now a little, a little bit of a bounce. Again, I'm not going to try and hold. I'm not, I'm not going to use my brakes. Might have to, but either way, the only thing I will say about landing this thing is that I would not start pulling back on the stick to ground the tail at least until you're below about 40 miles an hour. It, it will still really pick this plane up. So, we can stop. Now I'm going to use my brakes. Alright. Well, almost did it. But well, that's what they're for. So anyway, that is pretty much it. We're going to run into the review here, and that's going to be it for today. Alrighty. So if you want to buy the Tiger Moth, it's about 18 bucks. You can get it from AntsAirplanes.com, just fly to the market, you know, most of the usual places. I really like this thing, and I don't really know that you can beat it for its price. The texture and model quality are quite good. I didn't notice any gaps in the model. The textures line up, the wood on the instrument panel looks nice, the gauges are easy to read, the engine model looks pretty good. Altogether, it's a pretty good looking plane. The sounds are crisp and clear, the engine sounds are nice, and overall I think it sounds pretty good. Flying the Tiger Moth is quite a bit of fun nice and stable. It's going to do really what you want it to do. Its pitch and yaw are pretty responsive. Roll is very slow, but given what I know about the Tiger Moth, that seems about right. So it's fun for aerobatics as long as you don't want to do an Immelman. It'll sort of do it, but it's, it's not going to look all that great. I did want to mention that though you can swap the skid out for a tailwheel, it doesn't change the ground handling. As far as the features go, I think this is a pretty good bang for your buck. The customization you get with the tablet is really nice, including the fact that you can move it around the cockpit. Engine wear and tear is always a nice touch. Most of the customizations are little things, but it is nice that they're there. You get 10 paint schemes, granted half of them are some variation of British Trainer Yellow, but either way it's still a pretty good selection. So overall the Tiger Moth is a good little barnstormer, it's a lot of fun to fly and it's fairly detailed. And it is pretty nice to have one made for Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020 and not something that's been ported over here. Again, for 18 bucks, it's a good deal. And that's pretty much it for today. I'm going to go see if I can get this thing to do a nice tail slide. So thanks for watching, everybody, and I'll see you all next time.